Hello, pet parents. Welcome to the Naturally Healthy Pets podcast, where we empower and educate you to be the best advocate for your pets, giving them a happier, healthier life. Are you confused about all the overwhelming information out there about your pet's health, nutrition, and overall wellness? Well, you're in the right place. I'm your host, Dr. Judy Morgan, an integrative veterinarian, author, and speaker. Join me for an exciting show where you'll discover the healthy options for raising your pets in a more holistic manner. Find out the answers to your questions during these short and succinct episodes where I chat with experts in the industry and showcase the latest products that will help your pets stay naturally healthy. So let's get to it. My guest today is Dr. Jean Dodds, and she has spent more than five decades as a clinical research veterinarian. She has amazing information. Uh, she started Hemo Pet in 1986, which today offers a wide range of nonprofit services and educational activities, and that is www.hemopet.org. She has written 175 scientific articles, two popular award winning pet health books together with Diana Laverger, and with a third one in press, and she holds 27 patents. We, are, we should bow down. We are uh, with royalty. I am so impressed. Jean, you have, a, first of all, thank you so much for agreeing to do this podcast, but you have so many brain cells functioning all the time. I, I feel like I need to up my game or, or turn on the game. I don't know. <laughs> thank you, Judy. You know, when your husband's a patent attorney, it's relatively easy to learn how to how to write patents and get patents because you listen to him when he creates them for other clients. So, well, there you go. I, I, I did not realize that. So that's a great little tidbit. So all we have to do is go find a patent attorney. Well, I happen to live with an architect, so I get pretty pictures and house designs, which, you know, that works too. <laughs> so uh, today we want to talk about One Health, and this is something that I don't think I ever heard that term until maybe in the past 10 years. And it started popping up at veterinary meetings and, and conferences, and we could start hearing lectures and reading about One Health. So can you just give everybody a quick overview, what is One Health? Well, actually, you know, it's a catch-all term that's become very popular worldwide, but it doesn't just apply to medicine. It applies to agriculture, to farming, to the ecosystem, to global warming, to all of the things that affect the air, the earth, and the sea. And so we all live together in this planet and we need to save it. That's what it's about. Awesome. So today we're gonna narrow it down a little bit. And what we want to talk about is comparative medicine, specifically in people and dogs. Um, is it true that dogs and people share a lot of the same DNA? Yes, we do. Um, dogs and people are actually very close together in terms of the kinds of things that they share because after all, after domestication from the wolf, the dog became our companion, as have cats and horses now, but the dog followed us. And in order to adapt, it had to learn to eat the scraps of things that we had left over and it had to learn to adapt to us. But interestingly, the dog's personality had something to do with it as well. <laughs> so um, how, what, what kind of things are we looking at um, when we're comparing people to dogs? Like how, are, are we using things that we're finding in human medicine to treat dogs? Are we using things that we're finding in uh, veterinary medicine to treat people? Does it go both ways? Well, both is true, but one of the ways before anything could be tried in human volunteers, we had to first test it in laboratory animals in, in a laboratory setting, and that could be non-human primates or dogs and cats, although most of them were in mice and rats because it, they were more affordable. And there's right. been a huge issue of the welfare of those animals, as you know, over decades. And yeah. thank God I was instrumental in being part of the community that helped regulate that uh, as it is today. So right. once you have it in the experimental setting, you then take it into the clinical setting in veterinary medicine. And that's where companion animals and domestic farm animals became very important to lead the way to doing parallel clinical trials in humans. Amazing. And 
Um, what are there specific fields where this is being used more? I mean, is it is it more common to see these parallels with infectious disease, with cancer, with genetic disease, or, or is it pretty much across the board? It's basically everything. There's been a huge emphasis, of course, on cancer. Um, inherited diseases are very, very important. Um, the parallel between the dog and certain disease states like dermatology, the microbiome, gastroenterology, the pancreas, the liver, the kidney, all of those, and the brain even, all of those are more and more important in terms of using the parallel studies to look at non-human primates and then humans. Interesting. So there was, um, uh, I, I want to talk about cancer a little bit because there was actually something that was on uh, national t television um, on 60 Minutes interviewing a veterinarian at the University of Pennsylvania. And when I practiced in New Jersey, we're very close to the University of Pennsylvania. So we use them for our, uh, you know, our internal medicine cases, big surgery cases, any anything that was kind of... Uh, on a different realm of complicated. Um, but uh, one of the things that was stated in this article is that many cancers that naturally develop in dogs share important clinical, biological, and genetic features to those that develop in humans, making the dog a relevant immune competent model to accelerate the discovery of safe and effective treatments for both humans and dogs with cancer. So can, can you talk a little bit about this study that's been done and what they used and kind of what their results were? Because it, it was pretty fascinating. Yeah. This, this, by the way, this program aired on November 27th on 60 Minutes. It's still available online. So your, your listeners, our listeners can actually look at it. And Addison Great. Cooper interviewed the University of Pennsylvania scientist, Dr. Mason, who with her colleagues in 2016 looked at the fact that osteosarcoma specifically was overexpressed when animals had a certain genetic predisposition and the same predisposition is present in people. Interesting. Yes. And the way they found that out was that they used dysteria, the infection that farm animals have that's relatively mild, minor. They used listeria monocytogenes, the organism as a vector to transport the gene that was overexpressed in cancers, especially osteosarcoma. And this is the HER2 gene. So the HER2 gene, which was first studied at Jefferson University in Pennsylvania, in humans, by the way, and then uh, also studied with Dr. Mason and her colleagues at the veterinary school, they found that the overexpression in many cancers was particularly strong in osteosarcoma because yeah. the human and the dog share that same uh, overexpression. And what happened was, in order to test the theory, they had to take human and uh, dog cancer patients that did not um, do well with conventional chemotherapy and surgical removal or whatever. And they have a story on the 60 Minutes of a young woman who had uh, was refractory to standard treatment, had the lower part of her, I think it was right leg, and no, left leg amputated, and then became eligible for this new Listeria vector trial. And what it does when you give the Listeria vaccine with the HER2 gene in it, it causes fever and malaise for a short period of time. So the patient, dog and person gets some adverse reactions for a few days and then it takes over and it blocks the cancer from metastasizing and growing and the end of this story shows this lady this young woman playing football again wow soccer again and so wow. the same thing has occurred at the university of pennsylvania in the canine osteosarcoma patients yeah, I think I saw in there that it said that uh, the dogs that were given the treatment lived two times longer than dogs that did not receive the treatment, which when you have an osteosarcoma, which is bone cancer, when you have an osteosarcoma diagnosis, that's 
not a good one. Not, you know, usually I think clients are told, well, we can amputate the leg, we can do chemo, we can do radiation, we can do whatever. Uh, and, you know, you've got two months. And it's, it's just never, ever a good situation. It's a horrible, horrible tumor. Um, the, 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 the particular HER2 gene is 40% overexpressed in osteosarcoma cancers. And you wow. have to prevent the overexpression of this gene, which promotes the growth of the cancer. And what this whole vector um, ATR2 complex does is suppress the expression. Now, isn't the, the ATR2, I've always heard that in relation to breast cancer, like all the commercials on TV, they talk about ATR2 negative, blah, blah, blah. Um, so do you know if there are ongoing studies looking at mammary cancer in dogs and breast cancer in humans using something similar? It seems like if it, if it works for this. Yeah, no, no, definitely. Breast cancer, pancreatic cancer, gastrointestinal cancer, definitely. I'm sure there are studies going on in people. Whether they've started any trials yet in the dog, I don't know. I, I, I don't know because this is all relatively new. Yeah. The, the fact that it actually worked. Yeah. <laughs> well, we need something that actually works because our uh, statistics for curing cancer are, are dismal. On uh, for a hemangiosarcoma, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thank goodness for uh, turkey tail. <laughs> That's about the only thing, uh, you know. From Pennsylvania uh, again. Yeah, exactly. Because they did the studies on the uh, initial um, I'm Unity supplement, which was turkey tail mushroom, and they showed really good results for hemangiosarcoma patients using only that therapy. Um, so, you know, good news, there are some things coming down the pike. And interestingly, um, in uh, the link to that uh, 60 Minutes um, story, they said that right now, University of Pennsylvania has over three dozen clinical trials ongoing in um in all all different kinds of disease problems, um, but they have 16 for naturally occurring cancers going on right now. Um, and then you had sent me another link about uh, management of liver cancer in humans and dogs, looking at hepatic carcinoma, which is much more common in people than it is in dogs. Um, but there's a, a big study on that going on at University of uh, California at Davis, um, so is, is it, is it pretty much across the board? Like if someone were looking for, uh, you know, clinical trials, research studies that, you know, that they, they've got this horrible diagnosis and they're really worried, um, do most of the veterinary colleges or universities have ongoing clinical trials like this? Do most of them do this sort of research? Most of them do. The, 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 the litter thing is different though, because it's, very rare for the dog to get a hepatic carcinoma. In people, right. it's more common as a sequelae to alcoholic cirrhosis, for example, or other forms of cirrhosis of the liver. Yeah, hepatitis. And so even though the disease etiology cause is different in people and the dog, the management and treatment is basically the same. So right. that's why it's one health. In the sense, you approach the disease and the two species in a similar manner to manage and control it. Yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting because I think it said that um, only 0.6 to 1.3% of dog cancer is hepatic carcinoma, um, whereas in humans, it's the sixth most common cancer uh, and the third leading cancer death cause for people. Well, if you look at for the University of, of Texas, for example, Texas A&M, they're a leader in gastrointestinal disease studies. Right. Um, that, that group has been that for a long time. And then University of California at Davis is a leader in studying genetic diseases and longevity um, in certain dog breeds and certain dog types. Yeah, that's what, I, that's what I love about the universities. They each sort of have their, their specialty that they're known for. Like I love um, University of Tennessee's endocrinology lab. I love that for, for, my, uh, for my adrenal testing in particular. Uh, Michigan State is well known for their thyroid testing, as is Hemopet. Um, and yeah. I, I, and Cornell I mean, and Tuttle's and yeah, yeah. So they all have their their different uh, niche and yeah. So I, I what I would say for people who are listening and they have an animal with a specific issue, you might want to you know do a little internet search and see 
is specializing in that? Because I live in North Carolina now, and I know that at uh, the veterinary school right here in North Carolina, they do uh, they have cardiologists that are really doing a lot of research with the Cavalier King Charles Spaniels, which is right up my alley. So yay, they're in my backyard. They're just impossible to get an appointment with. <laughs> it's an eight-month waiting list. <laughs> but you know, Judy, um, what they have to do when they do that is find out if their pet is eligible for an ongoing clinical yeah. trial because they're yeah, definitely the inclusion and exclusion criteria. But it doesn't hurt to check, absolutely. It does not hurt to check. Um, so a lot of them, if your pet has already received certain treatments, they'll be excluded. Uh, you have to agree to certain treatments. So, uh, But it is certainly worth, if you're kind of hanging on to the end of your rope, it's uh, absolutely worth checking to see what's out there. In honor of February being National Pet Dental Health Month, here's a quick word about one of our featured products, Dr. Judy Morgan's Dental Health Formula. Available in a spray or dropper bottle, this is one of Dr. Judy's signature products that makes caring for your pet's dental health easier than ever. No brushing required, and it's made with natural ingredients. Another one of our favorite trusted brands, 1TDC, is effective for both oral and joint health. These soft gels are so tasty, pets think they're getting a treat. Do your dog or cat a favor by focusing on their dental health today. When you purchase these items at drjudymorgan.com, use code PODCAST01 for 10% off as our thanks for listening. Your support helps us educate and empower pet owners worldwide. So thank you for partnering with us and sharing this knowledge. So I know you also wanted to talk about some of the uh, heritable bleeding diseases um, and some of the crossovers in, in a One Health perspective between humans and dogs. Um, so let's talk about hemophilia. I, I'm, I, the only reason I know anything about these diseases is because before I had Cavalier King Charles Spaniels, I had Dobermans. And so von Willebrand's disease is way up there on the list of things. Yeah, Dobermans have a very long list, but <laughs> von Willebrand's was one that was way up there. And so I learned about it very early on in my career as a veterinarian. And I actually had to treat quite a few Dobermans that would come in with spontaneous nosebleeds and and that sort of thing when I was working in emergency. So uh, tell us what's going on with that. Well, very interestingly, when I was a veterinary student at the Ontario Veterinary College, um, 1964, we graduated, by the way. And in the 50s, when I started doing that, I became curious about, I wonder if animals really do have as many diseases that we see in people. And I started thinking about that. And right under my nose at the Ontario Agriculture College, there was a colony of beagles for biomedical research. And that's another story we won't touch now. But <laughs> those dogs had chronic demodex mange. And they had bruising on their face and on their belly. And when we studied them, they turned out to be the first animal model of factor seven deficiency, clotting factor seven deficiency in the beagle. And it was all through the commercial beagle colonies to the extent that some of the colonies, you know, that were raising research beagles didn't know what to do with the positive ones. So oh, they geez. started selling them as a special group at more money because they had the factor seven deficient gene <laughs> because the half-life of that clotting factor is only four hours. And so if you were looking at liver issues, for example, and it's made in the liver, you could use factor seven as a marker for what was going on with the liver cell. Interesting. So here these quotes, genetically abnormal animals became more valuable than the normal ones. <laughs> anyway, so then I started saying, well, maybe we can look for other diseases. And it was so amazing, Judy. Everywhere I looked, I found them. <laughs> So hemophilia amazing and sad. <laughs> well, yes, that well, but but well, not really. It was a it was an educational eye opener sure. because we share one health, right? Yeah, we're mammals. So hemophilia A by Queen Victoria's famous in inbred quotes quotes family. We had hemophilia A all over the world. Okay, it was the most common form of hemophilia. Still is. The second form is. Hemophilia B, also called Christmas disease, after the first human patient surname of Christmas. And hemophilia B accounts for about 15% of the hemophiliacs that are born today. Okay. So hemophilia A was easily found. 
and we found it immediately by looking at animals that had excessive bleeding. Like you mentioned, the Doberman, but that's a different disease. Okay. So then, in 1952, they identified hemophilia B, a factor nine deficiency, in Los Angeles, of all places. <laughs> and amazingly, seven years later, when I was a veterinary student in Guelph, we found the same disease in Cairn Terrier of a very important bloodline. Okay. And whenever I, I was a sporting dog enthusiast at that time, and I used to show visas and pointers and English setters. When I was at the dog shows as a veterinary student, this famous breeder of Cairn Terriers would pretend I wasn't there. <laughs> she was afraid I might say something to her that would be overheard that would implicate her dogs in this disease. It, it's not, she didn't create it. She didn't know it was a mutation. Right. So seven years later, we had hemophilia B in the dog like the human disease. And wow. then in 1970, I've in the German shepherd dog from Germany, a whole line of shepherds that were taken out of Germany because they had problems and sent to <laughs> North America. They flooded the market of German shepherd dogs and they had von Willebrand's disease. Oh, and the second breed we recognized it in was the Doberman, like you said. <laughs> so, so where are, what has happened today? With the advent of modern technology, nanotechnology for the treatment and the identification of these diseases, we now have CRISPR technology, C-R-I-S-P-R, which is the Nobel Prize winning technology developed by two ladies, Dr. Jennifer Doudner and Dr. Emmanuel Charpentier. Charpentier in Paris, Doudner at, in uh, California. And it's shared with Harvard and MIT because Dr. Downer did her graduate studies in Boston. So those people developed the process of gene rearrangement, gene editing, and gene therapy. Wow. Today, we have gene therapy cures for hemophilia A in people in August of this year, and hemophilia B in people in November of this year. And wow. both of those are used with non-pathogenic parvovirus vectors. Can you believe huh. that? It costs $22.5 million to do the cure for hemophilia A and $35 million for the cure for hemophilia B. It's more rare. They might say, oh my God, why is it so expensive? Well, the technology to develop all of this costs this much money. And right. somehow society has to bear that cost. How it's oh going to work, we don't know. <laughs> but, Judy, the cost of treating and the suffering of these patients that are oh, continuously sure. bleeding can't work. Some of them try to commit suicide. They don't want sure. to have any intimate relationships with their family. They're afraid of spreading the gene. That's much larger than sure. having these genetic therapies introduced into our society to help. That's pretty amazing. So this literally has been like a 75 year long journey getting to this point. So how does the how does the gene therapy work? Like how 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 does this cure work? And the other question I have and you may or may not know the answer to this, how how common are those diseases in people? I mean, we know they're kind of breed specific. It, we can probably see it in any breed, but we do know that we have breed specific genetics. Um, how common is this in people? These are is these this... are rare diseases. These are considered okay. orphan diseases in a sense. In veterinary medicine, there's no such thing as therapy for orphan diseases. Fortunately, <laughs> in human medicine, if it's an orphan disease, you can get special funding to help with it. So they're rare, definitely rare. Um, how does a genetic defect, first of all, you can have hemophilias if you have a deletion of the gene that makes that clotting factor, or you can have an abnormal gene. In other words, the, the factor that's made is dysfunctional, has the right. same clinical effect, but it's different. So what right. the um, gene editing technology does is it removes an abnormal gene if it's present, and it exchanges it with a healthy one. If there's nothing there, they put it in. 
depends okay. on what's going on with the patient. And, and by and the way, uh, so where is it put in? Is this a bone marrow transplant, a blood transplant? Uh, it's like, put in, put into the chromosome, into, into the, the DNA strands. You can go online and read about it. They snip it out. This is so interesting, sir. It, it's amazing. Total. That's that's why it's so mind boggling. Yeah. And j just before I forget, um, back in the years when I was doing this, we found factor ten deficiency. Stuart Power Factor, a rare human clotting defect also, in the American Cocker Spaniel. And that caused a furor to the Cocker Spaniel breed, of course. And the party color people said, oh, it's not in us. It's only in the blacks and the black and tans. You know how that goes. And then factor 11 deficiency, which is a disease that does not cause bleeding until you have surgery. It's a disease of severe post-surgical bleeding. And that was found in the English Springer Spaniel by our group. Wow. Wow. <laughs> As a model, you know. Yeah. You know, I, I love there's a, there's a couple of books and I think there's a couple of websites now that list them uh, where you can look up a breed, any breed and look at all the different genetic diseases that exist within each breed. And when people ask you know, what, what, what breed should I get that's the healthiest? I'm like, well, go look at the list <laughs> and see how many there are and then decide what you can live with. And, uh, you know, when you get a mixed breed, it doesn't guarantee, I mean, you could get the things from both sides. Both <laughs> sides. <be> worth. <laughs> right. There's a new paper that just came out about how the people perceive the value of genetic testing of the, quotes designer breeds. That's pretty interesting. And the, the company that has the highest number of Genetic marker test is now Neogene, N E O G E F, Neogen, I should say. Yeah. And I'm, I'm not promoting a particular company. It's a fact, okay? And years ago in Michigan at their headquarters, I gave them a seminar about how animals and people are the same. And I showed them a picture of vaccine issues and other things. And the CEO remembered that. And he wrote to me years later and said, this is really interesting. We should start doing that because they were only doing a few human testing for like uh, gluten sensitivities at that time. So now you can go online and get a list of all of the different diseases that they test for and what genes are involved. Amazing. Amazing. There's also other companies as well, you know. Sure. Yeah. I mean, the, the what we have access to now, I mean, thank, thanks to people like you who had an interest in this and, you know, said, wow, what's going on with these dogs? Uh, you know, I'd probably walk by and go, oh, that's interesting. And that would be that. <laughs> but it's amazing. Um, Jean, we could go on forever. You and I always have fun, and we always have so much that we can talk about. But this has been really interesting. Like, I've learned a lot here, and this has been really interesting. Um, I, you know, I've always kind of looked at One Health and went, eh. And, you know, it it is. It is so critical that we look at what is going on. And I, I really like what you said about it's not even just medicine. It's agriculture. It's because I've, I've really started looking at things like regenerative farming instead of what, what we're doing to destroy things. And um, so I, I, it all fits in. And I think that, um, you know, it's it's something that we all need to be more aware of. Uh, so for anyone who wants more information, www.hemopet.org. Jean has amazing information there about testing for different diseases, just about different diseases in general. She has great tests like the NutriScan test for um, food uh, intolerances or food sensitivities. Uh, you've got you've got books out. There's just so much information. Like if if you are an info nerd. You could you could go down the rabbit hole of hemopet.org and be there for months. <laughs> so thank you very much, Jean. I really, really appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thanks for listening to another great Naturally Healthy Pets episode. Be sure to check out the show notes for some helpful links. And if you enjoy the show, please be sure to follow and listen for free on your favorite podcast app. We value your feedback and would love to hear from you on how we're doing. Visit drjudymorgan.com for healthy product recommendations, comprehensive courses, upcoming events, and other fantastic resources. Until next time, keep giving your pet the vibrant life they deserve. 
The purpose of this podcast is to educate and to inform. It is no substitute for professional care by a veterinarian, licensed nutritionist, or other qualified professional. You're encouraged to do your own research and should not rely on this information as professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Dr. Judy and her guests express their own views, experience, and conclusions. Dr. Judy Morgan's Naturally Healthy Pets neither endorses or opposes any particular view discussed here.